in the northern part of the Fertile Crescent, within the rivers Tigris and Euphrates, lays a land of history and legends, of gods and deluges, of heroes and of men. In the ancient lands of Mesopotamia lays the cradle of our civilization and the soil of our imagination. It was in this land that people learned first how to write, and it is in this land that a journey with board games begins. Hello and welcome to Ancient Gaming, where I cover all games and show you how to play them. Today I bring you the very first board game known to us. Today we're going to talk about the Royal Game of War. The Royal Game of War is arguably the most ancient board game known to us. There have been other attempts to link certain archaeological finds like slabs to other games like Mancala, an hypothesis that argue in favor of Neolithic origins of such games. However, these claims are weak at best and have been refuted by many historians. The truth is, again, that very little is known about board games before the Royal Game of War. Albeit it is common thought that the early race games such as Ur itself or Senet do have their precursors. In any case, what we are looking at here is the very roots of race games, and of board games for that matter. In other words, this is truly old stuff. Well, not, not this one specifically, but you know what I mean. The game, however, wasn't by all means obscure within Mesopotamian society. The fact that it is usually referred to as royal is but a historiographic convention that stemmed from the burial site where several boards made of wood, inlaid with shell, red limestone and lapis lazuli, were discovered in the 1920s by the famous British archaeologist Leonard Woolley. The burial site was in fact the Royal Cemetery of Ur and thus the game came to be known as the Royal Game of Ur. Another popular name for it is the Game of 20 Squares, simply because of the fact that there are literally a total of 20 squares in the vast majority of our references. But aside from that, the Royal Game of Ur became increasingly common throughout the 2nd and 1st millennia BC, to the point that we now have over a hundred samples from Iraq, Iran, Israel, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, Cyprus, Egypt, and Crete. Which is certainly much more than what we do have for other more recent games that I covered in this channel. In fact, our body of references is so rich that we can even pinpoint relatively minor changes within the game's development within a more than adequate time frame. Which, given the age of such references, is no little thing to say, and certainly more than much of what we can say about many of the more recent games. We know, for instance, that early in the second millennium BC, the board underwent a slight change, which apparently prevailed throughout the remainder of its ancient Near Eastern history. The smaller block of six squares that had previously formed one end of the board was straightened out into a continuation of the bridge element to form a continuous projecting run of eight squares. A subscriber sent me this picture of a model he made himself that illustrates this change perfectly. On the left there is the original board game of the British Museum, and on the right is the one he made. Thanks a lot to Amadeo for this amazing picture, by the way. I will leave a link to his Instagram in the description. So, in other words, people did in fact play this game, and quite a lot actually, which together with our extensive body of archaeological references should make the game's rules easy to decipher, right? Well, if you follow this channel, you probably know that with ancient games, it is never that easy. Come on. As I said, we do have no shortage of references and archaeological finds that attest the popularity of the royal game in Mesopotamia for several millennia. And as we saw, we also do have actual game boards, and well-preserved boards for that matter. But at the end of the day, we are speaking about quite the amount of years, almost 4,000 to be more precise, and be assured, a game does not stay the same for that long of a period. Often when studying history, if you want to find satisfactory answers, you do have to ask yourself unconventional questions. Rather than how the royal game of Ur was played, I would suggest to ask yourself instead what did people play with the royal game of Ur, and even what was the royal game of Ur used for, and we'll get back to this one in a while. And in order to better illustrate what I mean, let me ask you this question. Do you know how to play backgammon? 
If the answer is no, uh, forget the question. If the answer is yes, you might be surprised that you probably wouldn't know how to play with people from other parts of the world that would have answered this question the very same way you just did, at least when thinking of the board alone. If you go to Greece, for instance, you would need to learn how to play Pakoto, Portes or Fevga. If in Turkey, you would be learning Multezim, and in Russia, you would be playing Narde. Truth be told, all these games are quite similar, but they are not the same. Chess wouldn't be chess if the bishop moved like a rook, wouldn't it? To give you some perspective, only the website Backgammon Galore accounts for more than 60 variants, all played on the same board, and there are many others. Well, with the royal game of Ur, much of the same is true. To the point that, in fact, the game of Senate and even Backgammon itself are but developed forms of this very game and concept. What I'm trying to say is that the royal game of Ur, as we know it, was most certainly played in different ways, depending on the time, geographical landscape and even cultural background. This, however, has not discouraged many historians in the last couple of centuries to try to reconstruct the most accurate set of rules based on the little written evidence we have. Remember that people in antiquity did not use to write the rules of the games they played. The most famous of these historians, and probably one of the reasons you stumbled upon this video, is the famous British philologist and Assyriologist Irving Finkel. But he is far from alone in this quest. We also have, for instance, the rules devised by R.C. Bell and H.G.R. Murray, two other old acquaintances of this channel. And on top of that, there are other many respectable variations that we will see in the gameplay section. In any case, most of these rules have their origins in a cuneiform tablet found in 1880 in Iraq, and that is now located in the British Museum under the name you see on the screen. The tablet was copied by a Babylonian scribe named Iti Marduk Palatu, and it actually went unnoticed for many years before scholars started paying more attention to it. In an article in 2007, Irving Finkel analyzed both this tablet and a photograph of an older tablet that was unfortunately destroyed during the Great War, but that also appeared to cover the rules of the game. The information in both tablets is somewhat cryptic, but clear enough to devise a game within the board, at least for the likes of Finkel. DLB, for instance, had cuneiform inscriptions that refer to the board as a melultu, or game in Babylonian, and even mentions Pack of Dogs as a possible name for the game. BM is much more interesting. The reverse of the British Museum tablet is subdivided into two columns, with lines that contain direct information about the gaming pieces, the dice, the throws needed to launch each piece, and the effect of the individual pieces having either landed on or failed to land on the marked squares of the track. So, pretty easy, right? Well, not so fast. As I said, the way this information is conveyed is far from transparent. And here we get to one of the questions I mentioned earlier was worth asking oneself as well. That is, what was the royal game of Ur used for? One thing both tablets have in common is extensive information about astrology, containing different omens and phrases, each linked with the sign of the zodiac, and each sign of the zodiac associated with a square of the central row of the game board. Furthermore, these omens and predictions are interlinked with the very same mechanics described for the dice throws and the movement of the pieces through the game board. Here are a couple of examples of such phrases, all referring to what happens when a particular piece lands on a rosette. The swallow sits at the head of a rosette. Should it then land on a rosette, a woman will love those who linger in a tavern. The rooster sits in the seventh house. Should it then land on a rosette, there will be an abundance of fine beer for the pack. Each piece bears the name of a bird, and all of them have their omen associated with them. Based on the information we have in these tablets, it is pretty clear that we are in front of a form of fortune-telling by lots. This, on the other hand, is nothing out of the ordinary. The origins of dice and dice rows is closely related with divination. I actually made a whole video about this topic, by the way. There you can see a more in-depth explanation of this phenomenon. Some historians go as far as to suggest that the third millennium boards from Ur were not necessarily used for mundane play, but that might rather have had a function to do with telling the future. While this might have been true for these particular boards, I do not think it's the case at all for the history of the game of 20 squares as a whole. 
This was definitely also played extensively as a recreational and gambling game, and in many cases, probably for both purposes. So one question left to answer is... What? It's so amazing. why don't we play this anymore? Well, that's a very good question. It's a very good question. Um, what we need is a bit of publicity in some kind of modern <laughs> electronic form. This is a question I see often asked. It is actually a great question, which is why I think the answer Irving gave to him was disappointing. Especially because I'm convinced Irving knows the answer to this question much better than I do. I know it's a fun little video and I just wanted to hear it. The short answer is that we don't play the royal game of Ur because we play backgammon. And the long answer We'll have to wait for when I make that video. I think we had our fair bit of the Royal Game of War for today, don't you? Now it's the time to learn how to actually play. The most known set of rules for the Royal Game of Ur is arguably the one devised by Irving Finkel that was popularized by his video with Tom Scott and the very copy of the game on sale at the British Museum shop. But keep in mind that, as I said, this game was most certainly played in many different ways, and sometimes with significant variations as for the implements used or the board and marked squares layout. The PM tablet, for instance, uses an ox and a sheep as straggle for the movement of the pieces, but the game could be and was often played also with marked sticks or tetrahedrons. The pieces themselves could vary as well. The same tablet mentions the known five bird pieces, which could also vary in design, but of common use were also flat tokens or just regular pedals. As for the decorated squares, with the exception of their rosettes, most of them are commonly believed to serve purely decorative purposes, perhaps related with the astrological aspect of the game on these tablets, but there is an ample variety of boards that either change the disposition of at least the rosettes or just do not contain any marked or decorated square altogether. In any case, you should not feel discouraged by anachronism when playing any particular version of the rules out there, since all of them are in some degree based in conjecture anyway, and as I always say, it would be a pity to let such things ruin the fun of a great game. For this video, I will be using the Kelsey Museum of Archaeology version from the University of Michigan, which is based in both Finkel's chapter and the Masters Games variation, which also happens to be the version I own, and considers most of the information gathered so far about the Royal Game of War, including the RC Bell and HDR Murray rule sets. This is also one of the versions I find most interesting and fun to play, but that's just my personal opinion. So, after that babble, now yes, how do you play the royal game of Ur? The goal of the game is to get all of your 7 pieces off the board before the other player. The pieces start outside of the board and follow the path described in the following image, with the first square being the one marked in green and the last being the one marked in red. The dice follows a system of binary lot rows that goes as follows. One white dot equals to one move. Two white dots equals to two moves. Three white dots equals to three moves. And zero white dots equals to four moves. Each player then throws the dice to figure out who goes first. The higher number has the light pawns and goes first. Then the game begins. Each turn, the corresponding player rolls the dice and moves, if possible, any of his pieces forward as many squares as the number obtained by the dice throw, and here there is some considerations. Each turn after you throw, you can choose between moving any of your active pieces or adding a new one to the board. You cannot, however, move two different pieces with the same throw. You cannot put two of your own pieces in the same square, unless it's a rosette. Rosettes can, therefore, be occupied by multiple pieces of the same player and also serve as a safe spot. If you land on a square occupied by the other player, you get to kick his piece off the board, so it will have to start again from the beginning. As mentioned, you cannot however land on enemy rosettes nor kick his pieces out of it. You can only exit the board with exact draw. So, if you are, for example, two tiles away from the end, you will have to score a 2. And lastly, if you can't move any of your pieces, you lose the turn, but you are otherwise obliged to move a piece if possible. There is also an optional and pretty common rule that states that if you land on a reset, you can opt to throw for another turn. And that is everything you need to know to play the royal game of Ur. As you see, the game is quite simple and straightforward, but complex enough to open space for interesting strategical decisions. 
This, on the other hand, is the core appeal of this family of race games, and one of the reasons why Pac-Man or the Tabula games became one of the giants of gambling and casual play throughout the Mediterranean and the rest of Europe up to this day. If you ever go to Greece, for instance, you will notice how all kinds of folks still play Tavli on a regular basis, and it is pretty common to find a Tavli board within a tavern. The simplicity of the board and implements also make the game work kind of like a sandbox. That is, it is not hard to change certain elements and mechanics to create a slightly different rule set that otherwise allows for completely different but engaging game experiences. For example, you can allow pinning to create a simpler version of Placoteau, or just remove the rosettes and allow stacking to turn every single square of the board into a potential safe space. I particularly enjoy this rule. You don't even need a board to play this game. Just draw the 20 squares on a piece of paper, throw a couple of marked sticks and use whatever is on hand for the gaming pieces. This is actually one of the most extended ways people played games in antiquity, and one of the reasons we've got so many game board layouts carved in stone slabs or pieces of wood. People, for instance, used to paint the boards on the sand. But that's a story for another day. And that's everything for today. So, uh, as always, thank you guys for your overwhelming support. These last two months have been very good for the channel, and uh, we reached 300 subscribers and are on our way to the 400, which is uh, definitely much more than I ever expected when I started this channel. So to me, see you like this content and want to see more of it, uh, well, it warms my heart, what can I say? As you can see, I changed my setup. Now I'm recording in Spain, in, which is the country I am from, and uh, I think it looks pretty cool, but you tell me. And before leaving, I also wanted to share with you guys something that I think is pretty cool. Uh, another subscriber, Jake Sanders, sent me this picture of a Nefatafel set he made with his wife after watching my Nefatafel video. And, I don't know, I think it just looks flat out amazing. So thank you again to Jake Sanders and Randy Lynn Reed for this amazing Nefatafel set. Uh, I think it looks, again, amazing. I will leave a link to you guys in the description so you can see the other stuff Randy makes. I think it's pretty cool. And I think it was a pretty good idea, so if you guys have like ancient board game replicas and things like that, send a picture to my Instagram and I will share it with you guys here. I think it's pretty cool that all of you can enjoy what each of you create as well. And with all that, don't forget to like the video if you learned something new, and subscribe if you want to learn more about other old games and how to play them. And if you want to go that step farther, share the video, that would really help a lot the channel. Until the next time.